Grand Junction Seventh-day Adventist Church um, for our Sabbath school. We ask that um, for those of you watching, whether it be on Facebook or YouTube, please like and share. And this morning our lesson is on the refiner's fire. And um, if you don't have uh, this quarter, it's quarterly, you can get it online or you can check with a, one of the Adventist churches around and they will give you one. Should we open with a word of prayer first? Father in heaven, we ask that you be with us this morning as we open your word, as we study your word. Give us wisdom and understanding. And Father, for those that are out there that he happen to be listening, we ask that they too would gain more understanding of what you want us to learn from these lessons. Um, be with us. Help us to present in the way that you would want us to present and help these to be your words we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. So this morning I have joining me, I've got Vicki on my right and Wanda on my left. And this is, the, this is the first lesson of this quarter. And so um, this lesson is the Shepherd's Crucible. But before we do, I want to read something that's at the, um, it's at the very beginning, kind of the opening remarks about the quarter. And it says, John 1, 3, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by him, Jesus. And yet, according to scripture, Jesus wept. The creator wept. Even more so, Jesus was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with a grief. The creator, a man of sorrows, despised and rejected, and he once cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? How could these things be? It's because Jesus, our creator, also was our redeemer. And as such, he was the crucified God, the creator who took on humanity, and in that humanity suffered through a life of privation and toil that ended with him hung on a cross, on a Roman cross. Thus, our Creator, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, suffered in humanity in ways that none of us ever could. We can experience only our own griefs, our own sorrows. At the cross, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, all of them. It's the most amazing act in all cosmic history. Yes. And I think when we're talking about... Um, the crucible's fire, which is what this whole quarter's about, I thought that really said a lot. Agreed. Um, so let's get into <coughs> lesson one. Um, we'll start on Saturdays. What is a crucible? Do you it's a small dish that is made of material that can be heated extremely hot, and it's very often put on a little three-legged stand and a fire put under it. And then whatever you want to purify is put in the crucible and the heat purifies. Okay. Um, any other things about a crucible? One, I looked it up and that is exactly what it is. And that's the reference that it gives. It also says it's a severe test which would be that particular crucible would be a severe test with whatever you're putting into it, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to change it somehow. Um, it's a situation which, which great changes take place. For example, if you're putting a block of gold in there or a piece of gold, what happens to it with that high heat? It'll it melt. It changes it. Melt. Yeah. And it, it changes. So that's what it is. So when we talk about the shepherd's crucible, what are we talking about there? I think that to me that tells me that my shepherd is with me as I'm going through these trying times. And um, sometimes he leads it to us. Sometimes we get ourselves into it. Um, I saw on, on a video of a sheep and the and, and more I see and know about sheep, I see and understand how stupid they really are. They are very simple. And it showed this shepherd, this huge sheep was caught in this trench. 
and it was about this wide. And it was really hard for the shepherd to get him out. He finally got him out, and he jumped over here on the left side of the trench, ran a little ways, and then went to jump over the trench and fell right back <laughs> into the trench. And we do that ourselves a lot. Aren't we considered the sheep? Yes, we are. <laughs> well, I, I don't know where you're going with the question about what is the shepherd's crucible, but it shows an illustration of the shepherd's crook there at, at the beginning of the lesson. And in many ways, that shepherd's rod or staff um, represents um, a painful experience because the shepherd uses it to, um, I, many times I saw my grandfather um, hook a sheep around the throat when it was going in the wrong way, going in a dangerous direction, and it would stop, but it was not comfortable for the sheep. Uh -huh. Or he would catch them by the hind leg and they would struggle. But that, that rod, that staff, was painful for the sheep, but it also was protective. Right. Exactly. Right. Good illustration, yeah. On Sunday is a guide for the journey, the shepherd. Um, would you read our first verse there, Wanda? Psalms 23, verse 1. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What picture comes to your mind when you think of this kind of a shepherd? You shared, like with your grandfather, being a shepherd of sheep. Um, here it's talking about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What's the picture that you get there? The first thing I picture is that wonderful green pasture and that everything's pleasant and wonderful. And he's just overlooking and watching us and protecting us and guiding us. Everything oh, hurting. is pastoral. And right. Yeah. A good, <laughs> a good picture, yeah. Yes. Um, so he, he a guide and directs. Well, yeah. if it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, it must mean that without the Lord as our shepherd, we would want. Mm -hmm. There would be things that we needed that we could not achieve for ourselves. Or things that we think we need. Correct. Sometimes we yeah. need it and sometimes, sometimes we don't. We don't, yeah. Um, you think of some people, um, for example, some people, say with a gambling problem, they think they need that. Mm -hmm. they, they have that drive. Do they really? It's an addiction. It's, it's an, an addiction. addiction. Yeah. Um, let's, let's look up some of these texts about what what we learn about what a shepherd is, the picture of the Lord as a good shepherd, as our shepherd. Um, I'll start with you, Vicki. Would you look up Isaiah 40, 11? And while she's looking that up, would you look up Jeremiah 23, 3 and 4? Do me to go ahead and read or wait? Go ahead. Ooh, sorry. Okay, 4311. 43 or 40? 40. 40. 40 11. Verse 11, yeah. Okay. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. So what do we learn about the good shepherd in in that lust, that verse? Oh, I have two one memory, uh, my mother was asked to sing uh, one of the arias from, um, oh, now it just went out of my head, <laughs> <laughs> from the Messiah. And um, in that song, it talks about, and gently lead those that are with young. And my mother, when she came and sat down beside me, she leaned over and she said, Oh, I wanted to laugh because she said, I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knew that. And so she, she, that made her uh, chuckle. But the thing that, that I think of here is the shepherd is not distant. Mm -hmm. He's 
He's carrying them in his arms. He has them on his bosom. He's gently leading. And mm -hmm. you don't lead with a rope or, or a string or whatever that's 50 feet long. It has to be a short one that keeps the animal close to you. So God is, he's not far away. He's very close to us. Good. And um, would you read Jeremiah 23, 3 and 4? <clears throat> okay. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whether I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. And what do we learn about our shepherd here? Well, he has sheep that are not in his current fold, but they're out there and they're still sheep. So he's bringing them together with his current flock and bringing them in. And uh, that's another loving step of a loving sh shepherd. And the fruitful, they're going to grow and increase. Um, when the uh, Israelites were in Egypt, they greatly multiplied from like 300 to couple million over a period of time and they were his sheep and he was letting them get ready to go back to the promised land mm -hmm. and ultimately that's where he's leading us is to mm -hmm. the promised land something else in that verse that came out um, yeah what else did it say about other shepherds yes he will put other shepherds set up shepherds over them so they'll be individual shepherds taking care of different small flocks Mm -hmm. And um, I see our, our pastors and our lay pastors as some of those shepherds yeah. that the Lord has given us. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And Vicki, you're going to share? Shepherds. Under, Under shepherds. shepherds. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, yeah. That's, and that's a, a very honorable place to be. Humbling. I, I often feel that as a deaconess, I am an under-shepherd. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a very honorable and it's a big responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, Vicki, Ezekiel 34, 12, and Wanda, John 10, 14 through 16. Ezekiel 34. 34, 12. Okay, I should have been ahead of you there. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Going back to the one she read, too, I like it that um, it said in there, they will no longer be afraid. Mm -hmm. So when, when we're being led by our shepherd, we don't have to fear. Well, and that gathering together. Mm -hmm. it's Collectively there's, there's worshiping together does right. help strengthen us. Yes, yeah. Right. All right, Ezekiel 34, verse 12. As shepherds seek out their flocks, when they are among their scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. Um, the man who wrote our quarterly talked about how um, in Africa, the sheep can all, from different flocks, can all get mixed up together. But a shepherd knows how to call his sheep, and they know how to listen to his voice. Right. And so pretty soon, all those sheep are with their own shepherd. Correct. Yeah. Isn't um, that neat? I saw a video of an uh, mm. Irish gentleman who was a shepherd, and, they were, and he swore he knew each of his sheep individually. And they didn't believe him, so they took some paint and put in an X on the stomach of three sheep from another um, shepherd's flock and they mixed them all together and they said okay now tell us which ones are your, are not your sheep and in less than 30 seconds he identified all three sheep because he knew his sheep mm -hmm. and I was just in awe at how quickly he was able to identify out of a hundred sheep three f sheep that were not his no oh, interesting <laughs> That tells us a lot about our shepherd then, doesn't it? It certainly does. Okay, and John 10, 14 through 16. 
which yeah. is going right into what you were talking about. Yes, it's what made me think of it when I was looking at it. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep, and I am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I like the fa and the Father, and I lay down our life, my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not from this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall bear my vo hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. Um, I love how his sheep know him. They yes. know his voice. Yes. And he knows them. And that he and his father jointly are laying him down to as a sacrifice for removing sin from our world. Yes. Mm. I thought all these texts that they had put in this lesson were beautiful. Yes. Our, our lesson this time is on the 23rd Psalm. And what testimony does the psalmist David give about this scripture song? Um, Vicki, would you look up 2 Samuel 23, 2? I mean, uh, who wrote, for, first of all, who wrote the psalms? David. David. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to learn what, you know, what testimony he gives for writing what he does write. Okay. 2 Samuel Second Samuel twenty three two. Okay. <clears throat> the Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. So what is he saying? Is the what gives what gives David um, his scripture songs? The Lord. The Lord. Yeah. Yeah. He gives all credit to the Lord for that, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And would you look up Psalms 23, 2 and 3? And here we're going to learn what places does the good shepherd lead his sheep? Okay. Uh, what Psalms verses? 23, verses 2 and 3. 2 and 3. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So what pleasant places does the good shepherd lead his sheep? Ah, those lovely green pastures <laughs> just full of grass to eat and still waters. And um, I know the author feels that at this time the shepherd had dammed up some water so it wasn't rushing and flowing. Mm -hmm. It was very calm, very cool, um, and uh, almost probably could see like a glass of... Uh, in a mirror. Mm -hmm. It was so clear and, and perfect. And this is a very peaceful, wonderful thought. Sheep won't, sheep won't drink for the water no. rippling and over rocks and stuff. They have to have still water. Right. And the shepherd knows that. So right. he provides what they need. Um, my translation says in verse 3, he leads me in right paths for the sake of his reputation. So he wants to take good care. The Lord takes good care of us because that reflects um, uh, our allegiance to him is then is, is seen to be valuable mm -hmm. because he takes such good care of us. And where is he leading us? Well, I think there are paths that are good, and then there are paths that are a little rough, and, and rough terrain to get us to another pasture. Um, but ultimately, we want to look at the ultimate goal. Okay. My translation says he leads me in right paths. It may not be the ones I would choose. Right. Correct. But they're the right ones for my character development. Yeah. One of the things that, um, in in some of the stuff that I was reading, it says... God's ways always leads home. Mm -hmm. yes. And I like the way that was put, always <laughs> leads home. Mm -hmm. So in this, in this 23rd Psalm, right off the bat that we see that God's care and provisions, right off the bat, um, mm -hmm. all of us have a journey, and we have different paths that are taken. But... We have to remember that 
if we're not following God's path, we're not, we're not being led home. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. We're not being led in the right way. Um, it says in our lesson, would, uh, let's see, the paragraph that starts, but why are these paths called? Um, Vicki, would you like to read that? I'm not sure where you are. On Monday. I'm sorry. Oh, all right. All right. Oh, but, yeah. But why are these paths called paths of righteousness or right paths? Here are four important reasons. First, they are the right paths because they lead to the right destination, the shepherd's home. Mm -hmm. Second, they are the right paths because they keep us in harmony with the right person, the shepherd himself. Thirdly, they are right paths because they train us to be the right people, just like the shepherd. And finally, they are right paths because they give us the right witness. As we become the right people, we give glory to the Lord. They are right or righteous paths, whether the, e whether the going is easy or hard, whether it's one I would choose myself or not. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. And I liked what it said there, um, the next paragraph, it says, when God is guiding, it is always about his training his people in righteousness. Yes. So the question at the bottom was, how can trials change your life so that you can better reflect the character of Christ? I know that when I've had some trials, it's, it's um, been an opportunity for me to lean on God more, ask for his guidance and ask for understanding. It has refined my character. Um, and, uh, and there have been times when I've been very angry at God for what he's been doing what are allowing to have happen. Um, but I've learned that if he allows something to happen, there's a good reason for it. Yeah. And he can take these evil events and change them into positive events that are connected to salvation. That lead us home. Right. And that's yes. what the crucible is all about. Right. Yeah. Is that purification, that, that building up the qualities of righteousness in our lives. And... Um, I wish I was more like a sheep that was willing to follow wherever <laughs> she was led. But sometimes I get balky, and I've seen balky sheep that would not go into the pen or wherever it was Grandpa wanted it to go, and he'd grouse and growl, and he would have to use his crook and force that sheep to go, okay, now I'll go. You know, and I, I'm balky like that sometimes. I don't, I don't like what it lies before me. But I know from looking over my shoulder that it's always best mm -hmm. if I go where the shepherd wants me to go. <laughs> Our personalities get in that way, don't they? <laughs> they do. <laughs> so... One of the things that I put is that, that trials help shape our character. Yes. And, you know, if we don't have these things happening to us, if, we, if life is just going along smooth, are we really looking for our shepherd to lead us? No, we're not paying right. attention to the shepherd. We're being busy leading our own, aren't we? Right, right. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that we need to remember that when we're going through that, we're being shaped and molded the way he wants us. And the us. purpose of the crucible is to take out what is dross or mm -hmm. is waste. Impurities. And purifies right. the gold or the silver. I had a student uh, uh, when I was teaching deaf children who became a silversmith. And that always fascinated me how she would purify the silver. It had to get really hot. Mm -hmm. And um, then, then the, the, the scum that's on the top, you know, the bad things in my character, God has to take off. Scrape them off. And that's right. Yeah. It is through this refining process that Christ's character can shine through. When gold is 99.999% is pure, because they can't make it 100%, um, it becomes very, very soft and malleable. And when beaten down to like 165 per hundred millionth of an inch, I mean, it's really, really super thin. 
it becomes very clear and transparent and, and it can be held up and Christ's character can shine through. And that's what he's doing with our characters is, is helping us to become refined so that he and his love yes. can shine through so that others can see that and be drawn to him. Exactly. Let's jump into Tuesday. Tuesday's an unexpected detour, the valley. Mm. <laughs> Wanda, would you read 23.4? Psalms 23.4. Okay, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Oh, there's a lot in this verse, isn't there? There sure is. And you know, so often when we're in that deep valley, we tend to forget he's with us, that he's right there with us in that deep valley, yeah. don't we? Yeah. Um, Easy to forget. It is. It is. We, it's very... we, all of our focus turns to us and yeah. poor me, you know. I get all elbowed the knee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One time uh, when I was going through a really hard time, I was sitting in my office because I'm in nursing management and um, I just felt like I was in the middle of a storm and it was darker than midnight and the winds were blowing and it was horrible. And I sat at my desk and I was praying and I said, Lord, I really feel alone right now, but the Bible tells me that you're with me. So I'm going to reach out my hand and I'm going to ask you to take my hand and help me through this. And all of a sudden, Jesus was standing there in my mind's eye in this picture and he took my hand, and I was like a three-year-old. I was really small, and he was big. And we started stepping forward, and one step, two step. And then the third step, it was like we walked through a curtain, and all the blackness was back there. And then all of a sudden, it was sunny and bright, <laughs> and I could hear birds singing, and I'm going, okay, God, you're leading me. Thank you. But it was really an eye-opener for me that even in those dark times when I don't think he's there, he really and truly is there. And, you know? and we have to accept that we, by the eyes of our faith. Yes. We can't, we can't see it, we can't feel it, we can't, um, nobody looking on can see it or anything, but the eyes of our faith, there's a scripture that talks about opening the eyes of our faith so that we can see mm -hmm. that he is there. And I think that's a very good point when we're reading <laughs> Psalms 23. It, it, how much faith we need to believe all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting that David said the rod and the staff are a comfort. Mm -hmm. um, when a sheep gets caught around the neck by the shepherd's crook, um, I don't think that's very comfortable for it, but I wonder if in our experience as God drags us back from the precipice of disaster or as we get ourselves into trouble and he, he helps us to come out of it, eventually we come to see that rod as a comfort. Exactly. Because he uses it to protect, to uh, make us more safe, um, to not let us get beyond our depth. And there's where our character is being formed yes. more and more. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the lesson brought out um, the shadow of death. The shadow of death. It's, it says it's an image for very deep shadow or deep darkness. Um, made me think of, have you ever gone to the planetarium, for example, and they said, okay, we're going to turn out the lights and, you know, put your hand in front of your face. Do you see anything? And that black, that, it's almost a thick, deep blackness, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And when I think of this deep shadow or this deep darkness, that's what I think of, that it's just so heavy on us and so surrounding us that you feel like there's no out. Very engulfing. Mm -hmm. And I think, 
I can't imagine that anyone would not have had that experience. Yeah. Um, that, that total uh, inability to see beyond what's right here. Um, and and those, are, those are difficult times. Sometimes it's so dark we can't even weep. Mm -hmm. um, but he's there. Mm -hmm. And um, those deep shadows have a purpose. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've often thought those, the ones out there who don't have that relationship with God, who don't have that faith, how deep and how dark that must seem at times mm -hmm. not to have, to feel like you don't have someone that you can turn to. And that's why the suicide rate just it keeps going up. We say, well, it spiked. Well, no, it keeps on going up. And particularly among young people who don't, who, who have felt totally abandoned. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that's one of the reasons why we have this assurance, so that we can share it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the next part it asks, do you have fear even though you knew that the shepherd was there? What Bible texts were most precious to you at that time and why? I had done a sermon not too long ago, and so this one for me was easy on those Bible texts to jump to. Um, my first one was Jeremiah 20, 28, 11, or did I write 29, 11? For I know the plans that I have for you. Mm -hmm. And that's one that, you know... I. I always went back to. Another one was um, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. And how about Hebrews 13, 5? I will never leave you nor forsake, forsake you. you. Wonderful. You know, those are, those are texts that when you're, when you're just feeling like you're at the bottom of the barrel mm -hmm. and that there's no one there to help you. I, those are texts that I had always jumped right. into. One of my favorites is Isaiah 65, 24, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. He knows what we need. That's yeah. Matthew 6, 8. He knows what we need before we ask him. Yeah. But we do need to ask him, and sometimes we just need to say, Lord, I don't know what to ask for. Guide me, show me, tell me what I need to ask for. And Holy Spirit can take that jumbled mess that we don't know what to make of and, and make it clearer to us and, and translate it to heaven so that God can answer our prayers. He is always, always, always there with us. I like the point you made. He can take our jumbled and... Trans you know, a lot of times people will say, well, I don't pray because I don't know what to say. Mm. And, you know, I think that was a very good way to put that. He takes things that we don't know what to say and turns them into beautiful he does. words. One of the stories I like to it, it share is a little girl was uh, praying and she was going through the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And her grandfather asked her what she was doing. And she says, well, I'm not sure what to pray for. God knows what I need, so I'm just going through the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> good point. I thought that was very cute. <laughs> you know, my mother, I think sometimes our mothers loom larger than life. My mother was a very dominant woman, but in her later years, I discovered that she had many, many fears. And um, the text that she, I would often hear her whisper is Psalm 56, uh, verse 2. And in the, in the King James, I think it says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. What time I am afraid, and mom would whisper that over and over. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Oh, good. And that's one that comes to me. Yeah. What time I am afraid. Uh, I think I'm a lot like my mom. I get scared about many things. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. What time I am afraid, I will trust in and thee. And that brings another one. Fear not, for lo, I am with you always, you know? Yes. Always. Always. Yeah. Um, do you think the sheep went their own way or did the shepherd lead them into that valley? I think both. Sometimes we do it ourselves 
and sometimes he does it so that he can help refine our characters. Well, it says he leads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He leads, and so even if, even if I look at the circumstances and say, oh, Lord, I was really stubborn there, wasn't I? I was, I wasn't listening, I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention, and I got myself into this. Uh, that happened just recently. Uh, something that I thought was innocent turned out not to be innocent. <laughs> and I had to confess my, my poor vision, that I didn't see it. But in that darkness, I knew he was still leading me, mm -hmm. still leading me, and always forward. He never leads us backward. No. Never. Well, I guess I kind of looked at that a little different than you guys. It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, to me, that's telling me that I chose that valley. Doesn't mean that he's not leading me out of that valley, but sometimes we choose to get ourselves into places that we shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. We allow um, Satan to be our leader at times. Sometimes we do. Or just want to be my own boss. Exactly. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but even when we want to be our own boss, who, who are we allowing That's to right. put those That's thoughts right. into us, you know? Mm -hmm. We're either listening to God or we're listening to Satan. Right. But here's the wonderful thing about our shepherd. He allows us to make that choice. You That's know? a huge blessing. Yeah. But he never, the, the other good thing, he never leaves us or stops looking for us when we do make those awful choices. Um, at the very bottom it says, Elizabeth Elliot writes, a lamb who found himself in the valley of the shadow of death might conclude that he had been falsely led. It was needful for him to traverse that darkness in order to learn not to fear. The shepherd is still with still him. With him. Yeah. So even when we're in those places when we can't see our hand in front of our face, we, we can remember that he is, he's still there with us. I read somewhere that in the Bible there are 365 verses talking about not fearing. One for every day. One for every day of the year. And I just think that is so synchronistic and beautiful. I love that. I hadn't heard that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. Well, the other coon used to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> One for every, every day of the year, and you never have to repeat. Yep. <laughs> That's great. Let's go jump to Wednesday, the unexpected detour, the surrounded table. And Vicki, would you read Psalms 23.5? You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Oh, what do you get out of that one? You prepare a table for me in the presence mm. of our enemies? What think, types of enemies? Oh, that's a good question. All kinds of enemies that are fighting against God, that are fighting against you following God. And I think this is another witness of the importance that God puts on us individually, that he's willing to set this, this special dinner, this special table. Um, one that came to mind to me was Esther when she invited the king and Nahum to come and to have dinner. Mm -hmm. The king and Nahum were the honored guests but there was a reason behind it, and it saved the Israelis. It saved them. Hebrews, right? The Hebrews. Yes, yes, the yes. He mm -hmm. Hebrews. It saved them. Yeah. And uh, so there are a lot of people out there, and Satan and his minions, uh, working very hard to help us not pay attention and follow him. I um, spent some time with this section of the lesson. Thinking back through my life, when the Lord prepared a table when I was surrounded by enemies, 
And I thought of three particular incidents in my life. And um, looking back, I can see the table of blessing, but at the time I didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so time, often with everything when I, we look back. I could not yeah. see the agony, the pain was so much in the forefront that I could not see that he'd already prepared what I needed, uh, what, what nourishment I needed from his word and from his presence. Um, so anyway, um, I think we all can identify that, that there are times when we can't see the nourishment when, mm -hmm. when our agony is too great, but it's there, we can trust him. Yeah. yeah. Would you look up Matthew 5, 44, Wanda? And Vicki, would you look up Romans 12, 18 through 21? Matthew 5? Matthew 5, 44. And verse 44. And when we're talking about types of enemies, it asks... What types of enemies have you had in your life, and how have you responded to those? What's my text? And your text is Romans 12, 18 through 21. Okay, Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And that has been a real challenge for me many, many times. Lord, help me to act as Jesus would. Help me to perform the work that I need to do as Jesus would have me do. And it is really <laughs> hard to, play, to pray blessings on somebody who has been mean and hateful to you. And... Um, but then I remind myself, God loves them, and he died for them just as much as he loved me and died for me. Yeah, we need to remember that they too are a child of God. They are. Just the same as we are. And that's hard to do sometimes. Very. I think betrayal is the very hardest thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to allow God to use to refine me. You know, to be betrayed by someone whom I should be able to trust, or whom I have trusted, and then to be betrayed in, in ways that are devastating. Um, and maybe that's I, a reminder. Where are we putting our trust in who we trust? Right. You know, maybe yeah. that's just a little reminder. Yeah. And we need to remember that. We can't hang on to that anger and that... Um, negative feeling because it's like drinking poison. Mm -hmm. We're not putting anything bad on that person. We're hurting ourselves yeah. more if we hang on to that anger. And it's better for us to release that anger, turn it over to God, let God work in us and through us and in that person and through that person to help change things. And once you forgive that person, it is such a freeing mm -hmm. release of of. Uh, negativity is just so beautiful. Well, I love the definition of forgiveness or the definition, yes, I think that's the right word, that forgiveness is a gift you give yourself Correct. because if you don't forgive, it's like you're not poisoning them, you're poisoning yourself. Yeah, right. And I think the very most difficult experience I ever went through to be able to say, I forgive and I love. Um, even though there were subsequent times when I struggled with that. Right. You know? yeah. I used to teach the junior early teen years ago, and my son was in that class, and there was another boy in that class. Those two absolutely hated each other. I mean, they couldn't find anything about each other they liked. Well, try teaching a class like that when, you're, <laughs> when you've got two boys in there that are just, no matter what one would say, the other one would go against it. You know, it was terrible. So I invited this boy to our house one time without my son knowing. Ooh. And I thought, these two are going to learn to like each other. 
Well, <laughs> my son was so mad to start with. Oh, he was mad. They weren't going to have anything to do with each other. Well, when you think that they're the only two there and they're going to be there together all day long, fortunately, my plan worked. <laughs> By the end of the day, they were like best buds. They found out they had a lot in common that they liked. And, and you know, they could agree on this and agree on that. And it just changed everything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think that's the way we are. Somebody that we think is our enemy and, and um, that we resent or whatever, sometimes we just don't know what path they're walking down mm -hmm. to be more understanding of them. In this particular case, this boy had a lot of unpleasant paths he was having to traverse. Oh. And so... I think with my son being able to find out some of this stuff, all of a sudden they could see more on the same page. Mm. So I think sometimes we need to think about that kind of stuff too when we're thinking someone is our enemy. Uh, Romans 12, 18 through 21. <clears throat> if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Mm -hmm. And, and it said in there, God will take care of the justice part. We don't have to. That's right. No. Years ago, um, I had a woman in the church that she just didn't care for me at all. Don't know why, don't know what I did. But it came around time for communion. And I thought, I'm going to ask that woman if I can wash, do the foot washing with her and wash her feet. Oh, that was an emotional breakdown for both of us. Still to this day, don't know what it was, but that ended that. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, I think we need to think about, we may not know what's going on, why someone is an enemy to us, but how can we break that barrier down? Mm -hmm. How can we let God take care of the justice part of it? Um, it says God is there preparing a banquet for him. For that for those enemies. In David's culture, when an honored guest came to, for a feast, the host would anoint, anoint his head with oil as the guest was about to enter the banqueting hall. The oil was a mixture of olive oil and perfume. Then the guest would be seated in front of far more food than one could ever eat. Have you ever thought of uh, inviting your enemy to your house, anointing them and, and feeding them? more food than they could ever want? No. <laughs> no, we don't. Most of the time we just kind of avoid no. them. Oh, they're on that side, I'll go this side or something, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. The thing that I think our, the writer of this lesson missed is that the anointing of oil is healing. Is healing. And that particularly olive oil has antimicrobial properties mm -hmm. and when it's poured into a wound it helps the wound heal and as the sheep are in pain mm -hmm. with a with a scrape or whatever and the shepherd catches them to help by putting the oil they they're not happy they they struggle but when that oil enters that wound and it soothes then they relax and I think of that so often, you know, when I've, when in my elbows and knees in my life, I've gotten myself into something that I ought not to have. And um, the Lord comes to me with words of comfort, and I'm not ready yet. I don't know. I, mm -mm. <laughs> but if I let him pour the oil of his presence, I can be healed. Right. I think it is a lesson twofold. One, it is a guest of honor, mm -hmm. and it is perfume, and it, it makes that guest of honor stand out. 
But like you said, the oil, the olive oil does have the antimicrobial mm -hmm. and it helps heal. So this, this person that is special has some wounds that mm -hmm. need to be healed. So I think it is, there's always several layers to many oh, yeah. things in the Bible. And I always like, it's like an onion, you keep peeling back more and more interesting layers and learn more. Yeah. So we too are under that protection from our royal host. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. Under that protection, under that, uh, like you said, the healing oil. Right. Let's go to Thursday. And we could go on and on on that one, but I'm looking at the time and we need to move on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> A certain promise for the journey. Um, Psalms 23, 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Do you always feel like goodness and mercy follow you? Mm, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you a funny story. When I was teaching, um, I taught deaf children, and um, I found a book in the library about three angels called Shirley, Goodness, and Mercy. <laughs> ah. um, and their adventures in taking care of the people for whom they were, had been, to whom they'd been assigned. But I always think of that, Shirley, Goodness, and Mercy. S-H-I-R-L-E-Y, -E Shirley, Goodness, and Mercy will follow me. <laughs> that God, He's there, mm -hmm. yeah. and it, it surely will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Psalms 34, 7, and the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that, that fear him, and he delivereth them. And fear isn't trembling. It fear is uh, awe and respect. Exactly. Well, I looked up the word mercy. Mercy means love, faithfulness, and loving kindness. So surely goodness, love, faithfulness, and loving kindness will follow me. And, and where it's talking about shall follow me, what is he talking about there? He pursues us. Well, there, is a, there are a couple of texts, and I did finally find them late last night, about God being our rear guard. Yes. Yeah. He, is, he not only is leading us, but he follows and protects where we are vulnerable. Yes. Yeah. He is our that... rear guard. <clears throat> I do like that word, pursue. Mm -hmm. I love that word. I just think that's awesome, and I hadn't thought about that before. Um, you know, f uh, follow is, you know, things are going mm -hmm. good. But pursue that's that's yeah. earnest and sincere and 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 I'm that valuable to God. Each of us are that mm. valuable. Well, to maybe God. you remember being in say grade school or junior high and there was this certain boy that oh, he was just <laughs> the What did you do? You pursued him. You wanted to be where he was going to be. You you hoped that he would notice you. Whatever. And I think <laughs> And God is pursuing us all the time. It reminded me of a poem that I have loved for many years called The Hound of Heaven. And uh, this, uh, this poem talks about how the hound of heaven pursues me through all the things of my life. And he won't, he won't quit. He won't desist. He continues to pursue all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that. And then it talks about the house of the Lord um, forever. What do you get with the house of the Lord? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, when, I, when I looked up some things on this, it talks about it's both a palace and a temple, um, a religious or royal sphere, in the image of the shepherd and the being, and the king, I mean. Just to think you would live in the house of the Lord forever with the king, with that shepherd. In our, go ahead. I was just going to say it's very humbling to think of that. 
I mean, that is the new Jerusalem. Yeah, he pursues us and wants us to live there with him. Come on, come yeah. on, let's go. Well, I think you said early, early on something about um, he leads us because there's a destination. Mm -hmm. Right. And this, this is the destination. Yes. It's his home. He always leads us home. Yes. That's what you said. Yeah, yeah. always leads yeah. us home, yeah. Um, would you look up Ephesians 1, 4, and um, would you look up 2 Peter 1, 10? So I'm looking up 2 Peter, right? 2 Peter 1, 10, and you're looking up Ephesians 1, 4. And this is talking about in spite of his, of his trials, uh, what two things does David say that he is certain of? Ephesians 1, 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I love that. Isn't that wonderful? Before the foundation of the world, before anything was ever created, before right. anything was made, this plan was in place. Right. And that reminds me, it says, you formed me in the in my mother's womb, that before we had personality or anything, yeah, he had already predestined us to arrive at his home. Right? Yeah. yeah, I love that. And Second Peter one ten. <clears throat> Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more er eager to confirm your call and election. For if you do this, you will never stumble. Wow. So if we confirm or um, ratify, maybe is another way, if we, if we make sure that we are committed to this leading, then we'll never stumble. And one of the translations I looked up, it says, be eager to respond to God's call. Mm -hmm. Be eager, because you'll never fall. Huh. I love that. Yeah. Be eager. Um, and the pursuing us, what picture do you get? And I liked it, what it said. Um, he doesn't give up. Right. When he pursues us, he doesn't give up. No matter if we're off in that deep valley, he never gives up. Thank you for being persistent, Lord. Yeah. Oh, and pursuing yeah. each of us. And when, at the bottom of the lesson, when it talks about how is the cross the greatest example of pursuit, there could be no greater example. Mm. No. Mm. Agreed. Um, when you think of the, the, cruci uh, the crucible with Christ, do you see yourself there now or have you? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, there's, there was a quote in Friday. It talks about there being seasons. Um, even though we may finally be victorious and arrive at the, at the shepherd's home, there are seasons wherein we are perplexed. We are, we are in trial in those deep valleys. Um, so there are seasons, and, and we just have to understand that. You said something earlier about things come to pass. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. They come to pass. Yes. And sometimes when you're in those seasons, like you said, you, you get so deep you think, where are you? Mm -hmm. you? You said you'd be with me always. Where are you? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I wanted to read something out of... Um, the E.G. White notes, and it was actually for the Sabbath study, but I liked it as our closing. <clears throat> it says, as Jesus, the great teacher, presents his lessons to be learned from the open book of nature, he opens the eyes of their understanding to reveal the attention that is given to objects in proportion to the rank they occupy in the scale of creation. If the grass of the field, which today is so beautiful, delighting the sen senses, and is tomorrow cut down and burned, receives so great attention from God, how much more will he not bestow upon man formed in his own image? 
We cannot form exaggerated ideas of the value of the human soul and the attention given by heaven to man. He then gives the comforting assurance. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you this kingdom. Jesus is the good shepherd. His followers are the sheep of his pasture. A shepherd is always with his flock to defend them, to keep them from the wolves, to hunt up the lost sheep and carry them back to the fold, to lead them beside green pastures and beside living waters. And I thought, that is such a comforting, mm. yes. comforting thought. Flock. Yeah. And we are at the end of our time. We thank you for joining us. Um, please join um, our next service, the Pastor's Sermon, and we hope that you attend and come back next week. Vicki, would you lead us in our closing prayer? Loving Shepherd, thank you that you have given us so many illustrations of the ways in which you, your heart leans out toward us. Give us the courage to trust and the, the joy of knowing that we are part of your flock. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.